Hi there, I am Dr. Jose Alfonso, coordinator of the Cornea and Crystalline Department of the Fernandez Vega University Institute and tenured professor of ophthalmology at the University of Oviedo. Today I would like to present the endokeratoprosthesis, a new design for corneal prostheses in the context of a new surgical technique for corneal transplant. The initial idea was to avoid penetrating corneal transplant in the event of poor prognosis by developing a technique based on current lamellar surgical techniques. The idea has been developed over the last few years and it can be said to consist of two phases. In the first phase, now more than 10 years ago, what we did was develop the technique without endokeratoprosthesis as discussed later. The technique was based on standard surgery for deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, that is, reaching a pre-disemetic depth of the receptor cornea and then placing a full thickness cornea in this bed. Logically, there is a space between the donor cornea and the residual bed that in principle we will fill with viscoelastic. We could also make sure that if the donor and receptor corneas come into contact there will be decompensation of the donor cornea. This is why we call it a pseudo-chamber protected transplant technique which is successful provided the two corneas do not come into contact with each other and so we insert viscoelastic between them to maintain the pseudo-chamber. For this reason, we decided to design a plastic element to separate the two corneas, the donor from the receptor. With the initial idea that this piece of plastic that we wanted to insert between both corneas, we contacted AJL, a company with which we have a good relationship, and suggested the development of a project to create this element which we call an endokeratoprosthesis which as mentioned earlier, is an intracorneal prosthesis. In about 2017 we began the first designs of the prosthesis and by 2018 we began to design a clinical trial that was to last two years. The endokeratoprosthesis consists of a peripheral ring, an optically neutral central disc and four spokes joining both elements together. It is made from PMMA and these two elements, the ring and the disc, are on different planes. The idea is that once the prosthesis is placed in the space between the receptor cornea and the donor cornea, they are completely separated. The indications for keratoprosthesis are situations in which a penetrating transplant has poor prognosis. Nowadays transplant surgery is based on lamellar techniques and when it is not possible to use these techniques, whether anterior or posterior, the prognosis for a penetrating transplant is also going to be rather uncertain. It is in this situation that we must consider a keratoprosthesis. Whenever a penetrating transplant is a solution that could be rather ineffective. This means we can implant the endokeratoprosthesis in corneas that have not previously received corneal transplant as well as those that have been transplanted, with either lamellar or penetrating techniques. This is one of the great advantages of endokeratoprosthesis, it can be used in any situation, with or without previous transplant. The endokeratoprosthesis implant technique can be divided into three steps. The first step is a lamellar dissection of the cornea just like when performing a deep anterior lamella technique to reach a pre bed which may be 50, 75, or 100 microns. In this bed we make a dissection of a peripheral pocket of 0.25 millimeters, that is if the trepanation was 8 millimeters, we have to make a pocket that is 8.5 millimeters. De tal manera que si la trepanación por ejemplo ha sido de 8 millimeters, tenemos que hacer un bolsillo que te llegue a 8.5. The second step is to place the endokeratoprosthesis in position. The central disc will push the residual bed of the receptor cornea backwards and the peripheral ring is inserted into the pocket we have dissected in the receptor cornea. One important detail that can simplify the whole surgical process is to suture the endokeratoprosthesis to the peripheral pocket with two 80 silk sutures. En el bolsillo periférico, 
This then enables us, once the prosthesis is held in position, to suture the donor cornea without any difficulty. The third step of the technique is to simply position the donor cornea with its three layers, with the endothelium, a full thickness donor cornea, on this residual bed and suture it in place using conventional methods. 16 radial sutures as usual. The post-operative period usually presents no complications, more or less very much like the post-operative of a deep anterior lamella keratoplasty. The fact that there is no perforation means that everything is quite normal and without problems. After six to nine months, we begin to remove the suture and it is completely eliminated after one year. During the postoperative period we will also decide what is best for our patient, that is, if we have a problem inside the eye that we think could affect the corneal transplant, the residual bed will always be maintained. We will always have the unperforated bed, the prosthesis and the donor cornea. However, if we see that the visual prognosis of the patient is good, that we have resolved the problem they had and which had caused all the difficulties with this cornea, what we can do is eliminate the residual bed at the level of the endokeratoprosthesis disc. This residual bed can be removed using a maneuver called endarterectomy of the residual bed. This may be performed using either YAG laser, femto second laser or vitrectomy scissors. That is, if we want to maintain the pseudo chamber and continue isolating the donor cornea, this residual bed will never be opened and if visual prognosis seems to improve, or if we have a better prognosis than what we first thought, this residual bed can be eliminated, and the patient's vision will be improved. Follow-up of the procedure uses two basic tests. One is anterior segment OCT which provides a perfect view of the shape of the pseudo-chamber and shows whether the residual bed has a tendency to bond to the donor cornea in spite of the endokeratoprosthesis. The other is to perform a cell count, also possible immediately following surgery. The endothelial cell count reaches very high and very accessible figures from the outset because the shape of the donor cornea after the first 15 days already enables acquiring this stator. The results of the procedure are really proving to be very satisfactory. The clinical trial which lasted from 2018 to 2020 and included 10 patients has demonstrated that the pseudo chamber is stable, and that the prosthesis is well tolerated and that the donor cornea maintains its properties throughout this time. Thanks to these data we already hold the CE mark for marketing the prosthesis. Among the advantages of the procedure, we can point out the intraoperative benefits which, logically have all the strong points of a lamella technique, that is, we are not really perforating the eye, therefore the whole procedure is closed chamber and even allows for associated operations such as cataract surgery. We have even had cases in which, after lamella dissection, we have performed cataract surgery, implanted a lens and then inserted the prosthesis and the donor cornea. The possibility of performing associated crystalline surgery is also an important benefit. The post-operatory advantages are practically the same as an anterior lamella transplant. The post-operative progress is smooth as there is no important inflammatory reaction because there is no perforation. There is also immunological isolation of the donor cornea and the risk of infection of an endophthalmitis due to perforation really does not exist. Therefore, all that is involved is immunological isolation of the cornea thus reducing the risk of infection compared to a penetrating transplant. It is also very important to note the possibility of of performing another transplant whenever necessary because we have not perforated the receptor cornea and so the possibility of a new transplant is very easy.
The drawbacks we must mention refer to intraoperative inconveniences. There are really no specific drawbacks, all we have to do is perform a manual pre-decemetic dissection. This technique is better than lamella dissection using the big bubble technique, for example. It is better to perform a controlled pre-decemetic dissection to easily reach the periphery of the receptor and create a pre-decemetic pocket for insertion of the prosthesis ring. The post-operative inconveniences we should mention are the tendency for the residual bed to bond to the donor cornea. In spite of having inserted the endokeratoprosthesis there is a tendency of the bed to bond to the donor cornea, Therefore sometimes while controlling the patient in the usual way, especially every week or 15 days the first month, we occasionally have to inject a small amount of viscoelastic into this pseudo chamber if we detect a peripheral tendency to bonding. The second inconvenience could be the elimination of the residual bed, something we do whenever justified by the visual prognosis of the patient, when we have a good visual prognosis. This should be done after at least six months following the operation, or even one year, when the bed has consolidated perfectly and no longer has this tendency to bond to the donor. Therefore always justify the elimination of the residual bed if the visual prognosis leads us to believe we will achieve better functional results. Otherwise it is better to maintain the pseudo chamber. And how are we thinking of developing the procedure? From the surgical point of view it is already consolidated. Perhaps the pre dissection must always be assured at the level we mentioned earlier of 50 to 75 microns and not take any risks because it's not necessary to reach dissemetic levels. The idea is to consolidate a bed and create a pocket because, I insist, the purpose is not to perforate, therefore we don't take any risk of going too deep in the lamella dissection. The other line of development is, logically, the changes we are thinking of making in the prosthesis for special cases. The endokeratoprosthesis can be available in more diameters. For the time being the clinical trial is with two diameters, eight and eight and a half. We need both larger and smaller prosthesis depending on the cornea we are to treat, as well as for cases when we apply the technique in patients previously operated for penetrating transplant. A penetrating transplant for example of 7.5 or 8 mm requires a smaller prosthesis so as not to reach the scar tissue of the previous transplant. Summing up, this new concept of corneal transplant we have presented is based on a non-perforating full thickness cornea transplant, and this is the key. It also includes implant of an endokeratoprosthesis, a plastic implant we call intercorneal. So far the results are really promising, it is an effective, safe procedure that we have already performed not only in a clinical trial with 10 patients, we already have more than 25 patients operated on using this technique. No substantial changes are required in our usual procedure when performing an anterior lamella transplant, the technique is practically the same. However it does permit technological and biological development of the procedure be it the surgical technique or the development of other modifications of the prosthesis. It even offers the possibility of retransplant, and in these situations we believe it to be extremely safe. Retransplant can be carried out because we have not really perforated the eye with the transplant and so retransplant can be performed if necessary. We believe that the endokeratoprosthesis represents the leading prosthesis in lamella transplant surgery. It is a new concept, a new idea, one adapted to routine lamella surgery techniques.